Thank you for joining us today. My name is Bill Baker with Firestorm, and it's a beautiful day here in the Atlanta area. Uh, the only negative is that we're starting to get some pollen from the trees that are out in bloom. But we'd like to welcome you today to this webinar. This is the Firestorm Georgia Independent Schools Association webinar. It's the third in the 2016 series. Today, our presenter, Jim Satterfield, the president of Firestorm, is discussing when others know more than you do. It's about visibility vulnerability. We like friends, and we invite you to become our friend on Facebook, Firestorm Solutions. And you can follow us on Twitter at Firestorm Soul. There is a hashtag. That hashtag is Crisis Coach. Firestorm transforms crisis into value and empowers you to manage risk and crises. Firestorm expertise is crisis management, critical decision support, crisis communications, crisis public relations, and consequence management. We need to remind you that our presentation today is not complete without the accompanying oral comments and discussion. And this work product must be read in conjunction with, with advice from your organization's personal counsel. In addition, do not interpret this information as legal advice or legal opinion. This webinar series, part of the Crisis Coach webinar series, is underwritten by the Georgia Independent School Association. They've been our sponsor in this, this series for the last couple of years now, and we're delighted to have them with us. There are a number of recorded webinars. You can go to firestorm.com and you can watch the past webinars. You can also register for future webinars. Our moderator, Jeff Jackson, unfortunately, is out on, on business visiting with schools. Jim, uh, would you like to say some nice things about the Georgia Independent School Association? Well, that's easy to do, Bill. And their upcoming meeting in March is, I think, just a couple of weeks away for those of you uh, to get together and learn more about uh, what's going on and the, the new activities that are associated with it. And we've enjoyed the relationship with the uh, Georgia Independent School Association over the last several years, and I think we're getting close to zeroing in on uh, 40 or 50 of the, these recorded webinars as part of an online training program, and that's something you can use at your school to extend that opportunity as we go forward. My name's Jim Satterfield, and I'm glad to be with you today and talk about this topic and uh, continue to try to answer your questions as we look forward uh, to dealing with our schools and our students and our parents and the vulnerabilities and threats that are around us. You may find yourself a target at some point. Uh, something's occurred uh, that's a, impacted one of your students or your teachers. Uh, your school becomes that target associated with it. And we're going to be talking about why would that occur? What can we do to fix it so that you're not the, at the center of the target uh, in the picture here? I'd like to encourage you to sit down with your team at your school and ask yourself what keeps you up at night? What are you, you worried about that could in fact occur within your school? What's going to give you the kinds of exposure that you could become the target in these events? And as you think about that, think about what are the warning signs that that would uh, be occurring? What should we be monitoring? Where will we get the intelligence that that's about to happen so that we can better control the outcomes and deal with the consequences associated with it. Today's topic we're going to go into is visibility vulnerability. And as we think about who knows what and when and what the, the results are associated with that. So as we uh, scroll on in this, someone knows. And the question is, do you know? Uh, the information is out there, and when you bring your insight to that information, it creates intelligence and makes it actionable. And are you the last to know? Uh, that's an important element here, because if the parents in your school are aware of a problem, or the students are aware, or the teachers are aware, you need to be aware so that you can make sure that the appropriate actions are in place and that we're moving forward on all of those topics. Uh, that will make a difference to the outcomes that will come from this area. Now, if this is going on and you're not aware of it, that's going to put you in a position where you're going to be surprised. And 
one of the things to keep in the back of your mind is that if someone has ill intent, 80% of the time somebody else knows besides this person. And 67% of the time, two or more people know. And when they know, what do they do? They talk. And where do people talk today? They talk on social media. So there's an expectation that you know what's going on within your school family, within your school community. Um, and that's the expectation of parents, of the students, of the teachers, of your entire organization. So if you're the last to know, that's generally not a good thing. Now, if we go back to that word surprise, is it good or is it bad? And in thinking about that, uh, there is a town in Arizona. It's about 200,000 people, so I guess that makes it a small city and not a town. Uh, that it's good to wake up every morning in Sunrise, Arizona. Uh, I've uh, never been there, but it, I'm sure they're very happy to be in Arizona and to experience those sunrises every morning. But generally, if you're at business and it's a surprise, or if you're at, at school and someone comes running into your office, it's generally not with good news. Now, my grandfather used to have a phrase that, uh, which would you rather have or a whipping? And it was the idea that there was a choice here, and you had to choose between those options. Um, I would go back further to think about the last time a surprise was good, and I was five, and it was my birthday. Generally, if you're a child, surprises have positive connotations. Uh, a visit from the tooth fairy, uh, Christmas, uh, birthdays, all of those elements are, are good. But when you're at work, when you're at school and there's a surprise that comes in, it generally has a negative connotation. And like our little circle face there, uh, it looks like, oh, what is this? Is this uh, what's going on? So as we think about this concept, our goal is to make sure that you're not surprised. That's where the intelligence network becomes important. That's why the visibility aspects that we're going to be talking about today become so extremely important. Now, we're in an environment today where there's a great deal of disaster denial. Uh, many of you on the uh, phone today have uh, had schools that have been in operation for a number of years. You've got a a strong uh, family base. Uh, you've got a good alumni base supporting the school and a phenomenal reputation associated with it. But we're in an environment today where any everything is foreseeable and tomorrow anyone may be found accountable. So all of that goodwill, all of that brand and reputation that you have built up over the years come back associated with you in this type of disaster. Now, in 1993, there was a truck bomb at the uh, World Trade Center. It was, uh, they got into the garage, set it off. There was some damage. They caught those terrorists, and they found them guilty in a criminal trial. But there was a civil trial that many people do, don't recall. And in the civil trial, the jury awarded damages as follows. Two-thirds of the liability to the building owner, one-third of the liability to the terrorist. Great country, America. How can that be? Well. This was an identified vulnerability and threat, and it was the expectation of the jury that the building should have had a plan in place to protect the tenants and to protect the public in that building. Over the last week, we've been following in the press the story about the ESPN reporter who was photographed uh, illegally in her hotel room from the adjoining room. It was a stalker who'd been able to figure out where she was. And, got the adjoining room uh, to that and then took pictures of her uh, and posted them out on the internet. And the, the lawsuit was for $75 million worth of damage and sued both the uh, person who was the stalker as well as the hotel. The jury awarded damages, I think, around $55 million. That may come down in the uh, appeal process. But an interesting element in that is that the jury awarded 49% of the damages to be paid by the hotel and only 51% by uh, the stalker in the adjoining room. Again, the concept that you should have known, you should have prepared, you should have protected. And that brings us directly back to the school marketplace and the services that you perform. You have care, custody, and control of a child. There's an expectation from all of the parents that are involved that you're going to return their child back to them in the 
same condition that they uh, gave them over at the start of the school day. There's a responsibility that we all have. And so understanding what we can see from that standpoint, making sure that we have programs in place to protect will make a great difference. And so this visibility vulnerability, anything that were to happen to a child, will be disproportionately amplified in this process. So as we think about crisis management and crisis communications, it's how we respond to physical actions that we take and how we communicate in those areas. And if we don't manage that correctly, it's going to create a second crisis, and that's going to be much greater than even the first one that would happen. Crises by nature are generally short-lived. They're not going to last for a long time. It's the consequences that can last for a great deal of time and ultimately define the brand and reputation of your school. It will be what you'll be known for as that's the school where this occurred, whatever this is. Now, we respond every year, um, both here in Georgia and across the country, to schools in trouble. Schools faced with problems uh, from uh, child pornography to sexual molestation to bullying, to cyberbullying, to suicide, to uh, violent acts that occur uh, across the board. And how those schools rep respond will determine how long that story lasts and how much issue will be raised. Now I want to interject a point here before we go further in the visibility vulnerability discussion and talk about a concept called media bias and media conflict bias in particular. The media wants conflict, uh, and as you can see from the little figure standing in between the two people, um, they're looking to try to move that from one to the other. They said this about you. What do you say about that? What do they? How do you respond to that? What What are you going to do next? And this back and forth keeps this in the news and to keep that area. It will never be to your advantage, and we're going to talk about communications in particular in a few minutes, to communicate with your stakeholders, your parents, your students, your teachers, uh, to communicate with them through the media, you want to communicate directly and not through that area. That's an important element for you to understand as we go through this process. Watch the elections that have been going on, and we've heard one candidate make a statement about another, and then they, the media goes to the other candidate. How do you respond to that? And then they go back to the first, and they keep this ratcheting back and forth. There is this conflict bias that the media has, because and why do they have that? Because it drives ratings, and ratings drives advertisers, and that drives money. So it is to their advantage to see this conflict continue to exist. And what we would encourage you to do is not to participate and that story will be much shorter lived than it would have been otherwise. So make that change now so that you're not going to become directly involved to continue that argument back and forth. We're going to take it out of the media's hands and leave it to control yours and yours. So as we think about visibility, and now you see me, now you don't, well, there is a good aspect of visibility. Uh, just as you see there with that sun coming up in the horizon, I guess that's in uh, surprise Arizona, we can say. Uh, that's how you build a brand and reputation of your school. That's why your enrollments are, are steady or increasing. Parents know that if my child goes there, they get a quality education. They'll run the right values. They'll have the right opportunities and friends. And they'll grow in every dimension that's important to us. And that's good. And we want that type of visibility. And I would call that peacetime visibility. If things are calm and everything is appropriate, that's exactly the kind of visibility that we want for our school. But if we've had a problem, if we've had a crisis, if there's an issue that's going on, we're then in a war environment, and we've suddenly become the target. And that type of visibility is very bad. And that's going to be what we're going to talk about in today's webinar and focus on specifically. Now, when we look at the definition of visibility and vulnerability, there are two elements here. One is an outbound, and the other is an inbound. The top one is talking about what messages that you're sending. 
if you're explaining in a crisis that you're losing, if you're identifying who you are, you're going to be under increased scrutiny. You're going to be that target, and you're going to be the one that becomes the story as opposed to the event itself or the reaction to it. The other aspect of visibility vulnerability shows the lack of your ability to see what's happening around you, what others are saying, what others are doing. And the statistics around this, and it, as we've shared, is 80% of the time if someone has ill intent, somebody else knows. And 67% of the time, two or more people know. And so the expectation from your parents, your students, and your teachers are that you're aware of everything that's going on. Again, remember that statement about a surprise. It's generally not good if you're in this area. But I want to focus right now on the first part of this definition. That's that ability for you to stand out where you get the attention. Now, you should be seeing on your screen a whole series of black and gray and white dots all scattered around. Um, if you'd look, try to find where your school is. Well, my, it's pretty hard to find my school because all the dots look similar. Uh, some are a little larger, some are a little smaller, some are a light gray, some are a darker gray, some are, are white. We don't stand out. And the reason to show you this slide is that's exactly right. You want to be blending in in a crisis environment into the background and not to be singled out. Now, if your school is singled out and you become that red dot in the center of the screen, it'll, it's a lot easier to pick the red dot out on this page. And when you find yourself in a crisis, you become like that red dot. The attention will be drawn to you. Your goal, then, is not to, per, uh, to continue to have that process focus on you, but to be able to blend back in. And your screen should be returning back to where your dot is now white, and you're not the center of the attention. How you respond will make a significant difference into the scrutiny that's placed upon your school and the lasting of this crisis and turning it over into a bigger event than it really became. So if it is never appropriate, never appropriate, to send a press release out when you find yourself in a crisis. You want to be able to communicate directly with your parents, directly with your students, directly with your teachers. You're not going to go to the media and say, can you say this to our school, school community? You know how to reach them directly, and it will make a significant difference in the outcome of what's going on. Because once you start engaging with the media, your red dot returns. And unfortunately, it doesn't return about the same time as all the other red dots on the page. It starts to grow and grow until it dominates uh, the discussion around it. Uh, when we uh, did the crisis management at Virginia Tech a number of years ago, there were 1,500 reporters that descended upon that campus. Think about your school. Think about what you would do with hundreds of reporters that were arriving there and focusing on who you were and what you're doing. So you should choose to comment only directly to your people and not through others. You're going to have pressure from your board and others to say, we need to get out in front of this. We need to do a press release. We need to hold a press conference. And that is almost always exactly the wrong strategy to deal with the consequences that we've been discussing. So let's go a little bit further back into that visibility factor for just a minute in terms of what you know. Who knows? Well, the answer is other people know. I gave you the percentages just a little while ago. Your people, your parents, your students, your teachers, they know what's going on. The media has knowledge of what's happening, and there's knowledge out in social media of these discussions around there. You need to listen and look at what's going on. Those two elements, listening or to words and strains and phrases around and about your school, looking at particular locations or events or people, and then that will help you put these puzzle parts together to understand what it is that's going on and what do we need to look at. Now, I would encourage you to think about um, all the risks and threats that your school faces. Uh, you probably have done a, a vulnerability or a threat assessment, or you've done a hazard impact analysis, or you've taken an all-hazards approach, 
And so for every one of those that you've identified that we should think about, what's a warning sign that that would be occurring? What's a trigger of that indicator or that warning sign that you need to take action and to respond? So if you think about how do you know what you don't know, and that's where this listen and look starts to come into play, is you know in many cases that piece of the pie there about what you know. You've got a pretty good understanding uh, of that associated with your school. And you also have a pretty good understanding of what you know you don't know. Hey, I don't know about this or I don't know about that. But the bigger portion out there is what you don't know you don't know. And I would encourage you, if you want to set an objective for this year, is to try to get that orange portion of this graph as small as you can. Think about all the vulnerabilities and threats that you have that you're exposed to. How can you start to develop a program to better understand each one of those things and to implement that program within your school to make a difference so that you're not having the surprise. You're not having a third party come running into your office to say that this is going on. Now we did a survey of hundreds of schools and we asked them, do you currently use external intelligence to identify potential threats? Less than a third, 30%, said, yeah, we, we do that. Now, I think probably all of our schools do something associated with weather. But once we get beyond that, we're finding that they, are, in fact, are not doing the type of monitoring that we're talking about today. 37% said no, and 30% said, I don't know. And clearly, that's the same as no. So two-thirds of our schools clearly don't have a formal intelligence program to manage the risk and threats that their school is vulnerable to. By the way, I would tell you the parents' expectations are flipped 100% on this. They expect you to have an intelligence program, and more importantly, they expect you to know what's going on within your school. So now we have a visibility vulnerability issue that can occur. So can you do identify your school's next crisis? Um, you need to build this intelligence network to have that area. And while you see a lot of things listed on the screen that are more business oriented, uh, today sexting, uh, cyber bullying, uh, sexual assault, uh, inappropriate relations, suicide, cutting, all of those issues are out there. Drugs and alcohol are around our young people. And you can have a program in place to be able to identify those before they escalate and turn into uh, a violent act that will have a significant damage into your students, into your brand, and your reputation. So when we think about crisis management, it really is more of a consequence management aspect. And to give you some tools here to start to think about how you can make these decisions if the majority of the information that you have is wrong at the start of a crisis, how do you decide in that environment? Because we're not choosing between here's a good option and there's a bad option, like my grandfather gave me earlier, which would you rather have or whipping. You're choosing between here's a bad choice and here's a bad choice. Now you need to pick one. Well, the first thing I'm going to tell you is that you're going to be wrong. And you need to be prepared to do that. And you continue to monitor and adjust as more information comes into play. Um, as you think about those aspects, the, you see on your screen a little feedback loop, observe, orient, decide, and act. This program is called OODA, O-O-D-A, for those words there. And it was created by uh, a gentleman by the name of Colonel Boyd. Boyd was a fighter pilot in the Korean War in the early 50s. And he shot down more MiGs uh, from North Korea than any of the other U.S. pilots. In fact, more than an order of magnitude more. Uh, and so the generals came to him and said, well, how come you're flying the same plane as everybody else, but you're so much more effective at this than any of our other pilots? What makes the difference? He says, well, I do it faster. And what do you mean? Well, I, I just take fast action. I, I uh, fly up to the left. I fly to the right. I, I dive. I curl back. I cut power. Um, I, uh, I dive my plane. So I have no observed that the MiGs can't respond to my actions as quickly as I can make them. 
and therefore then I come back and uh, observe that, orient myself to where I am, and find the best uh, plan to attack them, and then I act. Do that very quickly, and that's why I'm so successful. As a result of that, the military has taken this OODA loop cycle and uses it to teach our pilots on how to respond when faced with these types of threats to look at. But the same thing happens to each of us as when we're looking at a crisis that's occurring in our school. We have to observe what's going on. We have to orient who else might be involved and what are the other areas. We have to make a decision and we have to act. Time is rarely our friend in these types of crisis environments. So we need to be able to continue to monitor this because what will happen is we'll learn that some of the initial information we saw was wrong and that we'll have to adjust our strategies as appropriate associated with it. Um, so you've got to understand what's going on. You have to decide. You have to act. This monitoring has to occur, and then you adjust your strategy. This continual feedback loop is how you're going to respond. And if you don't have an intelligence network, you're going to be missing that information that you need to act so that those dominoes don't continue to fall. Now, when you're trying to make decisions in this type of an environment, it becomes a little trickier than uh, it normally is. And we focus on a predict, plan, perform methodology. You've got to look at what's known. Predict what the consequences of what you know those will be. Develop your plan, and then you have to execute. You have to perform at that level. Now, here's an important tip. Notes. Take notes on what you know and when you knew it. Write down just the mere process that you're writing it down on a piece of paper forces your mind to process that, that information and to organize it in a better manner to make the decisions that you need. Now, remembering that a lot of the information you learn initially could easily be wrong, you want to write down the time that you learned it, the source you learned it from, and then See if that's been verified. Are you hearing it from multiple people? Is this just a, a one-time element? You may find out that you the information is incorrect associated with it. Then what you have to do is to figure out what are my action priorities? What do we need to do? And you aren't going to be the person to do it, but you're going to assign it to others because you need to stay there and focus on making the decisions in this crisis environment. You need to have a follow-up uh, time. Uh, how long is it going to take you to do that one? Uh, half an hour, right? Get back to me then and just make sure that we've identified who was missing from school today or how we got uh, those elements. And then you need to confirm that it's been completed, whatever the action is, so that you remain in control in those areas. And many times you're going to identify something that you're going to do later because early in the crisis we're not going to communicate with parents we're going to deal with life and health and safety issues first. Once we have it stabilized, then we'll communicate, but put it on a list of a pending action that you'll take at a later time. If you want to organize your thoughts, you can focus on what do you know? Are you concerned? If so, what are you concerned about? What's your plan? What are you going to monitor? How are you going to monitor it? Who is going to be responsible for doing that monitoring? What are you going to communicate and how? As you put together your crisis response plan and your crisis communications plan, for every one of those vulnerabilities and threats that you've identified, what's our response? What's our decision criteria? What are our messages? What are we going to be able to say at each step along the way? It's easier to edit than it is to create. So if you've identified the message maps in advance, the probability of a miscommunication will be greatly reduced associated with that. Now, there is a transparency communications commitment that we generally do with schools, and I would encourage you to consider this for your school. Uh, communications, just like preparedness, is a continuous improvement process, and almost always any communication with the media does not benefit students, parents, faculty, staff, or the school. We would encourage you never to communicate through the media regarding the event. Now, what you want to do is, before all of this, though, is inform your parents, your students, your faculty, staff, and board that you're going to take this approach, that we're going to communicate directly with our stakeholders. We are not going to communicate through the media at this point in time. Because someone will be saying, well, we need to get out in front of this. We need to 
hold a press conference. We need to be able to hold a meeting associated with this. We need to get a press release out. So we inform those uh, stakeholders before that we're going to communicate only directly with parents, students, faculty, and staff, and the board, and not through the media after a crisis event. We're going to communicate coordination and compliance information with all appropriate uh, stakeholders. We'll tell parents that we're closing early today or uh, what actions that we need to take. And we're going to report um, if we had some problem that occurred to whatever the appropriate authorities are associated with it. We're going to commit to protect all personal student, parent, and faculty and staff information. You cannot talk to anyone about a child other than the parents or guardian of that child. We can't tell others what happened to this child. That would be a significant problem for us and for the families that were involved. Another reason for us not to communicate with the media. We're going to communicate only after the crisis actions have stabilized the threats that are concerned. Initially, we're going to be focused on uh, shelter in place, lockdown, lockout, uh, evacuate. We're not going to be dealing with trying to get messages out to parents that, oh, we're about to go into lockdown. We're going to go through it, stabilize the situation, and then after the threat has been stabilized, then we can begin our external communications outside of our students and teachers on site. We're going to communicate with the authorities in the event the safety or health of a student is to believe to be at risk. We've got that responsibility, whether it's uh, the family services or the police department. We're going to focus on all of those elements to be able to communicate directly with them to protect a child. We have that responsibility as teachers. And then we're going to uh, make sure that everybody understands how we're going to communicate to them. You may have an automatic notification system. You may be saying, we'll put that up on our website uh, and share that information on the website uh, so that they can see uh, what, what to do and how to respond in each of those areas. Or we'll send a broadcast announcement out through an alert system uh, that could be in place. We want to make sure that everybody understands this is where and how we're going to communicate after a crisis. If you put this transparency communications commitment in place in advance, then everyone knows. Everybody knows that they're going to get the information as soon as they possibly can and that you're the primary source of that information and it should not flow from the media to them. It will flow directly from the school to them. If you've got questions about this, we'll be glad to answer those. I also want you to start thinking about awareness. And I, I took cyber breach as, well, as an example because I think that's probably one that you haven't thought so much about within your school. But you'll notice that what we look at are information assets, brand and reputation, and user experience. And that is an example to start to show you that you could learn you had a problem from someone else. And whether it's a, a child who's contemplating uh, cutting or suicide, you're going to see that there are indicators around those types of things that could come together to let you know. So for every one of those vulnerabilities and threats that you've identified, every one of those all hazards approach, identify what possible indicators would be in place for each one, and those then become the triggers to activate your plans. Now, here's an activation matrix to think about <clears throat> when we focus on cyber breach. Hang on, I've got a call. And, and hopefully the germs didn't come through the phone there as I had that tickle. <clears throat> there it is, and now it's dealt with. No germs on that one, hopefully, too. As you think about your plan, whether it's lockdown, shelter play in place, evacuate, um, or lock out, having particular identifiers and actions that you would follow. I would encourage you, your, your, all of your plans, to follow the five stages of activation. I listed these again for cyber breach simply because I thought that was an area that maybe you had not spent as much time on. Pre-action is everything you're doing prior to the event, the training, the, the site assessments, the monitoring, uh, all of those programs, writing your plans, having your message plans. 
onset is the identification of the problem that's occurring and your focus is always there going to be on life safety issues. The impact assessment is how bad is it. The response and recovery is what do we need to do? How do we quickly uh, get back to work as soon as we possibly can and get our school back to normal or the new normal? And then post-disaster is reviewing what are the lessons learned? What can we do to improve our plans? Now, there are always maturity models. This one is, again, around cyber breach, but we can think about it in any individual area. You have to have oversight and management. That's getting your board involved, your senior leadership within your school, and the resources and training. Having a threat intelligence program and collaborating within that and the monitoring and flow of how that information is shared. Then identifying that the risk has occurred from a preventative, from a detective, how do we know that it's in fact uh, happening and then how do we correct the dependency that we have uh, both internally and externally uh, in each of these areas and then finally how we manage the incident and how we recover. Now we could take this into a different set of environments and we have maturity models in uh, workplace violence, behaviors of concern, continuity, crisis management, and all those individual areas, I wanted you to just to see the level of detail that ultimately you need to think about. So that's great. What, what should we be thinking about? Well, from a PREDICT standpoint, think about beginning creating this intelligence network. That's going to help you with one portion of the visibility vulnerability, the fact that if something's going on and you are unaware of it, again, that's an important element. Second, do the awareness and prevention training. Make sure everybody understands, here are our commands, here are our instructions. This is when we issue this, this is what it means. What should you be looking for? What could be an indicator that uh, there's domestic violence in a home or another problem is occurring one of our students? Doing a security assessment. What are the exposures that we have here at our campus and what should we put into place? Develop a crisis response and, crisis and uh, communications plan with message maps. It's easier to edit than it is to create. Pull those messages together in advance so that you're ready to deal with those issues. And then perform. You need to train everyone. Train your parents, train your board, train your students, train your teachers so that they're all aware of what's going on at any particular point. Now on April the 7th, we're going to do a virtual exercise. That'll be at 2 p.m. Eastern. And this virtual exercise is going to be on sexting and cyberbullying. It'll be a series of events that will occur, and it'll be a chance for you to make decisions. As you know, we, uh, every other month, select a topic uh, that's appropriate and do a test exercise. It's a two-hour event where you can have your crisis management team or your safety team or your emergency response team sitting around a table going through an exercise and making decisions about what they need to do uh, and to m deal with the threat or the risk that's uh, in place. Uh, last month we did one on workplace violence and active shooter. We had over 500 schools participate uh, with that with their teams around the table. Uh, sexting is a significant threat and it's a threat in public schools and private schools and religious schools and independent schools. It is a significant issue in today's world. Uh, we're responding to several of events that occurred this month in other schools uh, around that. And cyberbullying uh, is, in many cases, tied back into the sexting as both a precursor and a follow into that area. And so. You'll learn more about that, and it would be a great opportunity for you to sit down and think about in your school, how do we respond to these threats that are impacting our students? I would encourage you to take a look at your current insurance coverage. Does your insurance coverage align to the risk and threats and vulnerabilities that you have in place? There are new insurance coverages that are available. We don't sell insurance, but it certainly is a gap that we found in many schools. And we found that events occur and then they learn after the fact that the insurance, in fact, did not cover that. So whether it's sexual molestation or the cyber breach or uh, violence that occurs in the school, you want to know that you have coverage and you have that support. And you want to also make sure that you have response plans for all of these areas. 
we are going to be putting together a uh, behaviors of concern user group, and that's for uh, people that are implementing uh, behavioral risk threat assessment programs within their school. Dealing with identifying these elements before they rise to the level of violence in a school, whether that's uh, molestation or, or cutting or violence or, uh, in a worst case scenario, an active shooter, these events can be predicted and managed in advance. And so this will be a user group, and uh, we'll be sending out information. Uh, first meeting of this user group will be happening at the start of the third quarter. And it could be something that you'd want to consider within your organization. So there is going to be a brief on today's uh, webinar available. And uh, you can go to the Firestorm website and download that brief. You can also go there and uh, listen to a recording of today's webinar or have someone else on your team listen to the recording today. And there's a full library of uh, past webinars that you can refer to. Uh, our thanks to the Georgia Independent School Association for supporting this Crisis Coach webinar series over the last several years and making this available. And the difference that they're making in all our schools here in Georgia to create the highest possible learning background and opportunity to support the values that you want to instill in your students and families every day. Uh, you can go to firestorm.com to view this again or to view other webinars or to download the brief. If you've got questions, you can contact us at webinars at firestorm.com or you can call us at 800-321-2219. We're going to try to reach out to everyone on today's webinar to see if you've got questions or if there are areas that we can help. Uh, there's a, a continual challenge that we find ourselves in our schools every day. And I would tell you that you have a vulnerability associated with the visibility that you have. Every school family uh, that is there identifies with your school. And anything that happens there is going to have a disproportionate impact. The, they place their confidence in you that you're going to be able to manage the events and keep their children safe. I would encourage you to think about this concept of visibility vulnerability, of being able to uh, control your message and communicate directly out to those that are important in each one of these areas directly and not through the media. Secondly, I encourage you to make sure that you have in place an intelligence program to be able to monitor because that information is out there and in most cases you're unaware. We regularly contact schools to tell them of information that becomes a surprise to them. The term gun in school is mentioned over 65 times a day across the country. But every day there's a student who doesn't quite fit in, a student who is having difficulty who has domestic abuse in their family, or there's some other turmoil that's associated with it. That knowledge is in your ability to know and to know before it escalates into an act that could impact both them and your school. Thank you for your time today. We appreciate it. I look forward to speaking with you again uh, next month. Have a wonderful day, and enjoy the spring. Goodbye. <laughs>